Hello and welcome to my podcast using the law to empower yourself and to educate others during COVID-19. Before we begin I'd like to just explain that I'm not a lawyer but what I've been doing is a lot of research on the law in order to empower myself during COVID-19 and now I'm prepared to share this with others. So we're going to take a look at the law as it stands at the present time. We're going to have a look at current legislation around COVID-19, how to deal with business owners and how to deal with government enforcement agents such as the police or the courts and finally how to decline a vaccination or a medical test. So to take an overview of the law as it stands at the present time, it can be split into two categories, the law of the land and the law of the sea. The law of the land is the original living and true law of the men and women of the soil. It's underpinned by the Magna Carta and ratified by the British Constitution. It has one tenet, which is to do no harm. So that means to do no harm or injury to your fellow man or woman, to not defraud them, to not steal from them, not to take their property. Or to put it in a more positive light, we could say that under the law of the land, what is required of us is to stand in our power, to behave with integrity and to speak with truth. Under the law of the land, our word is our bond and agreements can be made with a handshake or in the presence of one or two witnesses. And then we turn to the law of the sea, or as it's sometimes known as admiralty law. Now this is a fraudulent fiction put in place by the powers that be, simply because the law of the land is so very simple to follow. The law of the sea admiralty law is complicated, it's intimidating, and one of the most important things of all, as far as the powers that be are concerned, is that it's revenue generating. It requires a signature. The law of the sea admiralty law can be further divided into three categories known as primary law under the criminal justice system, secondary law under the civil court and commercial law, business law. I asserted earlier that the law of the sea is a fraudulent fiction. Now, why did I say that? The reason is because the law of the sea only applies to cargo on the ocean and not to the men and women of the soil to whom the law of the land applies. Now, in order for the powers that be to lure the men and women of the soil into standing under or obeying admiralty law, the law of the sea, they had to come up with a subterfuge, a paper fiction. This is known as a straw man. And what really happens is when your parents or your guardians go to the registry office to register your birth, a copy of your birth certificate is made in black ink in capital letters. And this, along with your unique identification number, which in the United Kingdom is your national insurance number, is then metaphorically captured and taken out to sea where it is birthed. And at that point, your straw man is born. And your straw man comes under the law of the sea because it is birthed on the ocean. Now, in order for this delusion to continue, the so-called justice system then needs to groom the men and women of the soil through the early years propaganda program and through media reinforcement and intimidation to take responsibility for their straw man under the law of the sea. Remember that the living man and woman of the soil only come under the law of the land because they live on the land. So the trick for the powers that be is to get us to stand under admiralty law by being responsible for our straw man. It's the straw man that's answerable under the law of the sea, but unfortunately, because it is a paperless, soulless, dead entity, it can't go to court, it can't pay fines, it can't go to prison. It doesn't actually exist, but you do. So the powers that be have spent a lot of time trying to deceive you, the living man of the soil, into representing your straw man in court. Let's now take a look at current legislation that has been brought in as a result of COVID-19. So we have the Coronavirus Act 2020, which has been pulled together under emergency powers using the Public Health Control of Disease Act 1984. Now these emergency powers require scrutiny to ensure that the level of emergency is reasonable. 
given the level of death by disease. The other legislation that's been brought in is the Public Health and Safety Legislation of 2020, which is really health and safety for business owners to ensure that their employees and their clients are safe when using their premises. A lot of people are confused by the terms mandatory and the word guidance. So some people will say that this is a law, it's mandatory, it has to be enforced. And other people will say, well, no, this is guidance. So what is the deal here? What's the confusion? Well, under a democracy, all legislation must be seen to be reasonable and to balance the God-given civil rights of the individual with the needs of the population. So can this really be said to have happened in terms of the Coronavirus Act? Well, it's interesting that the government chose to downgrade coronavirus or COVID-19 from what's known as a HCID, high consequence infectious disease, in March 2020, before the Coronavirus Act became legislation. It's also interesting to know that even at the height of the outbreak, the death by disease level registered with the Centre for Disease Control registered it as a level two pandemic. And under a level two pandemic, masks, social distancing, quarantine of the general population is not necessary. So what we're dealing with here is really high level ministerial preferences spoken to the public as mandates when really they're just preferences. And the other thing that we're looking at here is that the, the government have very craftily under the public health and safety legislation of 2020 passed responsibility to attempt to enforce their legislation to untrained business owners. Can it really be said that what the government has done is fair and just? I'll leave you to decide that for yourself. Just to add that some of you may be a little concerned or confused, but I'm stating that the CDC pandemic level of coronavirus CV19 is currently at a two, probably now at a one. When the government has recently raised the UK coronavirus alert from a three to a four. So just to explain that the CDC pandemic level is based on fatality, whereas the UK coronavirus alert level is fixed on transmissions. In other words, the number of cases. Really, within a pandemic, we're looking for fatalities rather than cases of people who have it mildly or not dying from it. For the government to use their own coronavirus alert level to spread fear about this pandemic, to my mind anyway, is simply misleading and possibly even devious and manipulative. That's my view. So as I've said, the government has really quite sneakily passed responsibility for enforcing the Coronavirus Act to business owners and their staff. So let's have a look at what business owners can and cannot do. So first of all, they can't enforce mask wearing, social distancing or hand sanitisation, but they can use signage to encourage you to comply. They can't ask about any hidden disability or request to see mask exemptions. And they cannot enforce a medical intervention, such as a temperature check, a test or a vaccine, but they can ask your permission to undertake one and you have the right to refuse. They cannot require your contact details, but they can request them. And they cannot refuse customer entry for failure to comply to any of the government preferences around mask wearing, social distancing or medical interventions. So just remember that if the police can't enforce ministerial preferences, then neither can business owners. So how are we going to empower ourselves when facing business owners who want to make requests of us? So my suggestion is that we use the law of the sea, the fraudulent fiction, 
uh, of admiralty law and this is because most business owners will not know what you're talking about when you talk about common law. So here are some useful acts from admiralty law that you might want to use when facing business owners. So first of all the Equality Act of 2010 which deals with discrimination that you cannot be discriminated against. You cannot be asked to wear a uniform in order to enter somebody's store. That would be discrimination. The Disability Act of 2010. So this is about disability discrimination, having a disability or a hidden disability. As I said, if you have a hidden disability, it's up to you if you want to display something to show you have a hidden disability or not. A shopkeeper cannot ask about your disability and if they do so they're falling foul of the Disability Act 2010. Now the Data Protection Act 2018 is an interesting one because it deals with data confidentiality. So when it comes to dealing with giving our names and addresses or contact details, how this data is handled is of great importance. If you're faced with an open book for instance where all your details are openly recorded and other people can see them then this is actually against the Data Protection Act. If you're faced perhaps with just putting your details in a on a piece of paper and putting it in a box where very few people get hold of it, you might want to ask how your data is handled or once it's gone into the box. But the point of the Data Protection Act is to protect our data confidentiality. A lot of people have now received an email purporting to be from the NHS regarding downloading the new Track and Trace app. Once again, there is a question around the Data Protection Act around the harvesting of this data and how it's actually being used and how it's actually being stored. As far as I'm aware, the company developing this is a company called Serco. So I would be wondering, first of all, where Serco got everybody's emails from. Also, where the data from the track and trace is going. Is it actually going to the NHS or is it going somewhere else? And how exactly is it being used? So once again, if I was in that situation, I would be challenging it. But probably I would not take my phone with me so that I can have the option of writing my details details down and then continuing as I normally do with, with my management of dealing with writing my data down. In terms of declining medical interventions, whether that's having a temperature check before you go into a restaurant or declining a vaccination or a test, then the Nuremberg Code 6.1 allows every citizen to refuse a medical intervention without being disadvantaged. So a shop owner cannot, without falling foul of the law, refuse entry into their premises if you refuse or decline to have a medical intervention. We also need to think about our God-given civil liberties in the United Kingdom under the British Constitution, which protect our right to life, our freedom from torture, our freedom of assembly and our freedom of expression, amongst other things. Other things that you might want to use when talking to shop owners is what's known as legal ease. This is a language that the courts use and it's used quite often to intimidate us. Words such as compensation, liability, impose, lawful remedy, fine, civil action. And then we might want to use media speak, which is really the art of turning the possible into an actual fact by using words such as could, might, possibly or probable. So, for instance, we might see a media headline that says coronavirus could rise 100 percent in the next few months. Yes, it could. But then and again, it could not. But when reading that, we have been schooled under the propaganda program to believe it's a fact and move into being. Being afraid. It's always worth using that language back to shopkeepers in order to make your points. Now it's all very well for me to cite a list of admiralty law acts and legislation that you can use but how are you going to use them? So I'm just going to give you some tips. What I do recommend is that you use your own language and make this your own. So think about 
what you might want to say before you put yourself in the situation of fronting a shop owner or a business owner. So one of the first one of the first things that I would suggest is that you use questions. And this is because it puts you on the front foot and asks the person who's talking to you to stop and think about what they're saying. So what you might say, perhaps let's say somebody is asking you why you haven't got a mask or where your mask is, or they want to give you a temperature check or a test. What you can say is by what authority do you own the right to ask me that question, refuse me entry into this store, demand that I agree to this medical intervention give you my confidential data so you're asking them a direct question about their behavior and what they're doing you're asking them to just stop and think about what they're doing and whether they actually have the authority to do what they're doing and then you might after they've replied if they reply go on to ask another question such as are you aware that should you continue to coerce me in this manner I may be entitled to compensation from you personally from this store and from this brand under the Equality Act 2010. So you've used a little bit of media speak there using the word may be entitled and you've also used the word compensation which is legalese. You might say are you aware that it is, it is an offence under the the Disability Act to coerce me into wearing a mandated uniform in order to enter your store and that you could personally be liable to a fine or to pay me compensation should I seek lawful remedy. Or you might say, are you aware that under the Nuremberg Code 6.1, I have the lawful right to decline any medical intervention without being disadvantaged? And should you continue to persist, this could be perceived as assault on your part for which I can seek lawful redress. So there are just a few examples and questions of ways you might be able to empower yourself in front of business owners when they're trying to get you to wear a mask or to take a medical intervention or to take your contact details. Now let's look at dealing with government enforcement agencies such as the police or the courts. So rather than using uh, admiralty law as I suggested with business owners what I recommend you do immediately is to stand under common law. Now remember that under common law this is the law of the land this is the true and living law the one tenet is to do no harm. So the question you might ask a police officer is what harm am I causing? And you may want to keep insisting on asking that question and seeking an answer. Other things that you want to look out for is use of language. Police are trained to ask you certain questions or to talk to you in a certain manner in order to trick you into standing under Admiralty law, which means representing your straw man. So one of the most common questions a police officer will ask is, do you understand? Your response to that is no, because what you're actually being asked is to stand under the law of the sea and to represent your straw man. And this is something you don't want to do. It's worth noting that most police officers under the rank of inspector don't really know very much about common law. They're just following a process which is aimed at getting you to represent your straw man. If you are arrested, and taken to put to a police station. My recommendation is you refuse a duty solicitor because his job is once more to get you to stand under admiralty law. Silence under law is seen as consent. I also recommend that you say as little as possible, but don't refuse to answer questions. You might instead want to say, I don't answer questions. Be aware that the police officer will want to use as much psychological tools as they can in order to get you to submit to representing your straw man. That is why it's a good idea to say as little as possible, but to answer by saying, I don't answer questions. If you're asked your name and address, which is a common question, um, which you're, you're asked by police officers, your response could be something along the lines of I'm a living man or woman of the soil. 
The unlawful fiction assigned to me by the corporate government under my straw man is, and then state your name. So you are then making it very clear to the government enforcement agencies that you know the difference between who you are as a living man of the soil and the name of the paperless fiction known as your straw man, which was assigned by the government. Now, as I stated right at the very beginning, under the law of the sea, a signature is usually required. And once again, this signature is used to try and lure you to representing your straw man. When it comes to signatures, uh, we need to be careful how we we sign. So uh, it's best to use your ordinary signature. But to begin, especially if you're being forced to sign something, to the left-hand side of your signature, just write the letters VC, which is via coactus, which uh, is Latin for under duress. So you're stating straight away that you're being made to do this. You're not volunteering, in other words. And then underneath where you would put your signature, you would write your first name and then in brackets, of the tribe of and then put your surname and close brackets and underneath that write all rights reserved and when you've done all of that you write your signature diagonally through your first name where you've written first name of the tribe of and all rights reserved and you do that in order to make sure that nobody at a future point cuts out the little bit where you've you've put all rights reserved if on any statement or any piece of paper you see your name in block capital letters in black, that is representative of your straw man. Remember, the paperless fiction is made of a copy of your birth certificate in black pen in capital letters. So just cross that out and replace it with just uh, your name in a small case with capital letters for the initial of your forename and your surname. So that's how to sign paperwork at a police station or in a court without representing your straw man. Remember, the whole idea is not to stand under admiralty law, but to remain under common law, under the living law of the soil. Now, it may be that you've done all that you can and you have received a fixed penalty notice or indeed a notice to attend court. What can you do? I've put together a, a letter a sample letter that you may wish to use to write in to the person making the claim against you. And what you're basically doing is making a request of the person making the claim against you to prove and to evidence that the claim is being made against you, the living person of the soil, and not against the illegal fiction known as a straw man. It's very unlikely that they'll be able to prove that the claim is going to be made against you as a living man of the soil because this is the law of the sea and you do not stand under the law of the sea. You stand under the law of the land, under common law. If you are required to attend court, my recommendation is that you don't attend, that you write in again in a similar manner seeking clarification. Also perhaps search for the support of those with a good knowledge of common law. If you are forced to go into court, you need to state your refusal, refusal from the get-go to stand under Admiralty Law. And to always remember that if you're shown your name in capital letters in black, that is your straw man. That is not you. So you need to decline to represent that name. That is not you. The answer is no, that is not me. You are the living man or woman of the soil. But again, as I say, do seek if you are going into court, support from others who have a knowledge of the common law. It's always best to go into court without a solicitor and to represent yourself uh, because the, the judge or the court will look upon this differently as if you go in with a solicitor. It's, it's okay to go in with an agent who understands common law to give you advice, but I wouldn't recommend going in with a solicitor. When it comes to dealing with medical interventions such as tests or vaccinations or even temperature checks to your forehead, the response is to decline and not to refuse. And the piece of legislation that you would be using is the Nuremberg Code, uh, Section 6.1 
which gives everyone the right to refuse a medical test without disadvantage. So as I said, the right way to do this is to decline, not refuse. So how do we go about this? So first of all, if you have to attend for a vaccination or a test, make sure you get the batch number and the date of the test or the vaccine, and also the name of the person who is administering the test. And then you need to ask some questions. Some questions you might want to consider asking would be, are you medically qualified to use this device? Do you hold liability insurance? May I see that? Could you advise me of the ingredients uh, in this test or in this vaccination? And could you let me know about any uh, random randomised control tests done on X ingredient, perhaps uh, mercury or, or maybe aluminium, to test and verify that it's completely harmless? Could you let me know what qualifications you personally have to give a vaccination or a test? Are you familiar with any double blind tests that have been done on this product and can you explain what the data revealed? Is the manufacturer of this product prepared to pay compensation? Do they own liability for any harm caused by their product? Do you stand by this product? Are you prepared to sign a statement of liability to compensate me should any harm come to me as a result of taking this medical intervention. Now you don't need to ask all of those questions, you might want to pick a few. And then when you've got sufficient responses, that is the point at which you say, well, you know, taking everything into consideration, I really don't think that this medical intervention is beneficial for my long-term health. So with respect, I'm choosing to decline. And then you get up and you leave. So there you have it, uh, some information on the law from me. As I mentioned right at the beginning, I'm not a lawyer, but I have been doing a lot of research while this COVID situation has been going on. I do encourage everyone to do their own research and to arm themselves as best they can to navigate successfully through these difficult times. It only remains for me really to wish you all the best as you go forward and to thank you for listening to my little podcast. Thank you.